Mm. I, I was brought up by the most incredible man uh, in this entire world. Wow. And you know, Ricky Bekoro, like Rusal Rampasele, Papa called me Boki Special, the most beautiful girl in the world. Mm. Literally. Not Ricky Rene, ah, no. He called me Boki Special, the most beautiful girl in the world. Oh, wow. And I believed it. I think as parents, we can learn a lot from that. Oh, yeah. Because there's so many things we take for granted. Yeah. And the conversation we have with kids. Yeah. And discouraging them to Ooh. do things. Yeah. Was leak away. Yes. A person wanting to construct something. Kadika something. Sakamonto. You're thinking was leak. Can't you rebuild engineer? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just a small sample. Yeah. Of footballers. Corey, they just take one or two, ne? Yeah. And now they want to paint it like everyone. And it's I like think I, I was stuck at home with my dad. And I, I can only imagine what my dad didn't know what to do. Mm. You know, so when he would hear of the pageants, he just kept taking me there. And, you know, I just kept losing because back then, you know, the darker you are, you're not going to. Be careful. You, you have to watch what they're watching. Um, there's a lot that they're being taught and it seems innocent, and it's not. That's how we met. So as I was walking in, he was about to leave, and then his manager, he was Are like, manager? Eh? No. Are, are, this is... No, the manager... Ah. But one moment, you're the girl next door, and the next day, you are the girl that most South African little girls look up to. I always had this thing of, they, if they don't want me to win, they better not put me in the top five. Because you're gonna, you're going I'm, to smash I'm gonna that. kill it. I don't care how hot those girls looked. Yeah. I knew that if they give me that microphone, yeah. there's no way in hell you're going to crown somebody else. And that was my super. <laughs> Just talk with DJ Cappuccino. Escape to the luxurious Miropa Hotel in Polokwani and immerse yourself in a world of Moroccan-inspired grandeur. With 54 standard rooms and four luxurious suites, our hotel offers affordable accommodation options tailored to suit your needs. Whether planning a conference or seeking a weekend escape, our hotel provides the perfect setting for your next adventure. For bookings, email sunmeropahotel at suninternational.com or call our hotel reception on 015-290-5400. Hello viewers, welcome to another episode of Just Talk with DJ Cappuccino with Son of Gazani. Your boy, DJ Cappuccino. Yeah, we like calling each other, ourselves boys. But it's all right. So where we bring you inspiring stories and insightful conversations with the remarkable individuals. Today we have the honor of speaking with a truly exceptional guest, Bokang Munjani Chabalala. Bokang is not only renowned beauty queen, who was crowned Miss South Africa in 2010, but she is also a passionate advocate, dedicated mother, and influential role model. With a career spanning over a decade in pageantry and modeling, Bokang has uh, used her platform to champion various causes, including education, women's empowerment, health awareness. She's the director of Bokang Munjani Foundation. Uh, with, uh, I think they established the Bokang Munjani Chabalala Library, Autism Awareness Campaign, some of the things that she does, anti-gender-based campaigns, Dare to Dream campaigns, Sanitary Pest Drive, one goal at a time. Beyond her accolades in Beauty World, Bokang is also celebrated for her commitment to making a difference in her community and inspiring countless individuals with her grace, resilience, and unwavering dedication. Join us as we dive into Bokang's incredible journey, explore the challenges she has overcome, and discover the impactful work she continues to do today. Welcome to Just Talk with DJ Capacino. Thank you. Mm, <laughs> oh, I don't know. You know, I, I would like you to bring the viewers to that kid. Yeah. That child, you know. Just tell us about your early life, where you grew up. Sure. If there are fondest memories. Yeah. If, you know, those people that you can talk about. So that you can give us that picture of where you come from. 
Yo, I'm a girl from Rampatlele. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up uh, Rampatlele Siliting and um, best family life, mm-hmm. you know, with a, an amazing father, amazing mother, my two sisters. And I come from a family of three girls. So I'm mm-hmm. the middle child. Uh, so you can have a middle child syndrome, yes. So mm. be very careful around me. <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, you know what? I, I always say a lot of people oftentimes, you know, when you talk about a village, I mean, we later moved to Polokwani, but when you talk about a village, people think poverty and people don't understand what we, you literally have the richest life if you grew up in a village, there, yes. you know, a, a whole mm. complete fulfilling life. And, and, and that's the life I had. Um, next door if yeah. today our teacher dia pelo nka re no tsa moja ka next door you know yes. um me mongwe mo strategy sa ga go ge go roma o aya you know she can easily say bo ka ngo tsa mo yo re ka borotho o borege marotlo ya because ke motswa di you know um so i literally grew up in that environment e longo re tsona le ba thwa ba ntshi ba le ngo re ba go letse gae and then of course i think around the time of obviously after democracy 1995, then we moved to Polokwane. Mm, mm. And um, a very shocking experience, you can imagine, for a black little girl. You know, Tropo, yeah, Polokwane was not what it is now. You know, if I tell you how it was in 1995 in comparison to now, you'll be shocked. Because at the time, it was like three, four, five families, you know, Benina Park, mm. where the rest of the you know, yeah. um, you can't befriend a girl while that you, you know, no baba is Yes, you know, let's go. I get it one long, you know, I didn't mm. see, you know, and and you, there was just, you know, what there was um, the subtle separation that nobody ever really spoke about, mm. uh, but it was there. You could feel it in the atmosphere. Is it the reason they left most of them? After? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, you know. Yeah. But it was there. Uh, although I'm still grateful, you know, we, we really didn't get to experience the proper, you know, uh, as a apartheid, you know. Yeah. But that was my childhood. And then, of course, I attended PCS in Capricorn. Um, best thing ever, I'm going to say, that my parents ever did for me. Why? Because I was born in a kudu. And you know, you mustn't, you know, you must wait to be spoken to, blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And then I moved from Skolon Saraya to PCS. And within the first year, a teacher noticed something in me that was extremely special. The fact that I could stand on a stage and speak. And that was the first time ever in my life in 1994. Because that was 1994. So, yeah. so I used to travel. First of all, I want to transport from Rampatlele to town. Hmm. Because other kids don't attend school in town. So my father would have to take me from Rampatlele. Transport would take me to Polokwane for school and back. So 1994, it was a defining moment for me. Because for the first time, my voice mattered. My voice was seen as something positive. Uh, mm. The fact that I could speak was seen as something incredible instead of Wanobule mm. And mm. that literally changed the whole narrative for me mm. as a black little girl who had the gift of just speaking. Oh, wow. Yeah. But do you think there's a moment in your childhood that shaped the person that you are? My father. Like from primary school. The way you were in Karona, I was brought up by the most incredible man. Uh, in this entire world. Wow. And you know, Reiki Beko, like Rusal Rampasele, Papaka called me Boki special, the most beautiful girl in the world. Mm. Literally. Not Reiki Rene, ah, no. He called me Boki special, the most beautiful girl in the world. Oh, wow. And I believed it. Oh, he instilled it in you. I believed it. Yeah. You could never tell me I'm not incredible. You could never tell me I'm not beautiful. You could never tell me I'm not enough. You see this thing here, what's up? I don't know. Thank you. The power of the a parent's spoken word upon a child. I learned it from my father. Oh, that's powerful. And, and so that mm. is what shaped my entire life. How I was raised, the type of a home I was raised in, the fact that I grew up in a home where I was told I can do anything and be anything. Mm. And I always say, you know, my parents gave us the, the gift of choice. Mm. Literally, everything they did, every single sacrifice, it was so I could choose to be anything and 
anything that I wanted to be in this world. Dream big and believe Bona, you can achieve things. There was never a limit. Yeah. I've never grown up till this day, Mukering. I'm thinking of doing this and then Papaka or Mama Kabari, you can't. Mm. Every single thing I went to my parents with, you know, I'm thinking of always, you can do it. You can do it. I was literally allowed to try anything, fall flat on my face. They were always there to pick me up. But never, ever have I heard my parents saying you can't, ever, in my whole entire life till today. I think as parents, we can learn a lot from that. Oh, yeah. Because there's so many things we take for granted. Yeah. And the conversation we have with kids. Yeah. And discouraging them to Ooh, do things. Yeah. Was yes. A person wanting to construct something. Kadika something. Sakamonto. You're thinking was was like, Can't you rebel engineer? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I see. But what inspired you to pursue the career in pageantry? Was it after you started speaking? When did you realize... Um, Extraordinary. I don't look like many other kids from next door. I, I, <laughs> I'm just me and then I'm going to do my thing. I, I actually just fell into it because of my dad. So my mother worked far. Mama can never be kukune. And so my dad, I, I was stuck at home with my dad. And I, I can only imagine what my dad didn't know what to do. Mm. You know, so when he would hear of the pageants, he just kept taking me there. And, you know, I just kept losing because back then, you know, the darker you are, you're not going to win, Ay. you know. And Ay. I remember one day asking him, Papa, why did I, I'll, I'll never forget it because the pageant was in Luwa Homo. And I remember a driver down, uh, yeah, I, I just remember where I asked him the question. And I asked him, Papa, why didn't I win? And his response was, I mean, because I was. And mm. his response was, and I said, what is wrong with the judges? He said, did you see how ugly they are? Ugly people always choose ugly. They didn't, ugly people, they didn't choose you because you're so beautiful. Oh, wow. And it was mm. a defining moment mm. for me because I learned when I don't get something, it's not because I'm not good enough. It could be the problem, but probably it's a problem. always somebody else. You know, but it's never me. I'm always enough. And I remember he kept taking me, kept taking me until I stopped modeling when I did the first one in Polokwane. Mm. So for the first time, he brought me to a pageant here. And it was such a shock to my system because I was in a room filled with white kids. And I'd never competed with white kids. Mm. And these children, their hair was done, their faces were done. Never be the princess just to get one TV. Nike Liga Rogoyaka Yasuna. Trained to speak in public and rehearsed. And I'll not forget it was Little Miss Petersburg. And I made it into the top five with no training, no word of English. A village no, champion. I, exactly. But it, it did something to me. And I remember I cried. And my dad said, if you don't want to do it anymore, mm. you don't have to do it. And I said, I don't want to. And then I left it for years. After matric, I took a gap year. And then I got bored during my gap year. And then I thought, what do I, What can I do to keep busy? And then there was a modeling school. Okay. Somewhere in Mopolokwane. And then I went. And then I did the first pageant within the first month I won. The next one in three months' time I won. And then it was Miss Tin Limpopo I won. Win, and win, then win, was, no matter And then what. I was like, maybe I'm onto something here. Maybe Papa was onto something. Yeah. So for me, that's when I realized, especially Miss Tin Limpopo, this is it. I can actually thrive in this. Mm. Uh, and for me, the biggest part, it wasn't even the modeling part of it. It was the fact that uh, every single time I was in a pageant, I was given a microphone. And people got to hear me speak. I oh. felt seen. I felt heard. Mm. I felt validated. Be because I, I also realized at the, at the level you competed, it's all about articulation. Oh, and yes. How you respond. Oh, yeah. Intel it's not even about... because. More or less, all of you look good. Yeah, yeah. So now it's about what you say. You no, know, most definitely. Yeah. I always had this thing of they be, if they don't want me to win, they better not put me in the top five. Because you're gonna, you're going I'm, to. Smash I'm gonna that. kill it. I don't care how hot those girls looked. Yeah. I knew that if they give me that microphone, yeah. there's no way in hell you're going to crown somebody else. And that was my superpower. That mm. was my strength. That's why I did pageants. Yeah. Because you're given an opportunity to stand on a stage and give an opinion about something that you're probably passionate about. Yes. That mattered more to me than being in swimwear. Mm. Yeah. And 2010 came. <laughs> um, we had World Cup. Mm -hmm. The first gold, Bafana yeah. Bafana. A brilliant gold <laughs> <laughs> that we cannot forget, all of us. 
<laughs> from Tate Chawala. We all celebrated. By then, when you were busy preparing. From his essay. And you didn't know each other, right? No. Yeah. I, I know you've answered this question many times, <laughs> but how did the experience of winning Miss South Africa change your life? Because I don't sure. think it's a small thing. Um, I don't know how to say this, but one moment you're the girl next door and the next day you are the girl that most South African little girls look up to. It's, um, it's incredible. And it's incredible in, in a very humbling manner mm. because you realize the level of power you have Mm. you realize the type of influence you can have in people's lives. The damage you can cause. Sure. You, got to, you realize that now every breath you take, it's just not about you. All of a sudden, it stops being about you alone. Mm. And it's about everybody else who's watching you. And in a beautiful way, because you can choose to be a great impact or you can choose to really just not care. So for me, it, 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 yeah, it's incredible, but also in a way it also, it, you know, it automatically puts you 10 steps ahead of your peers Ish. and I'm talking growth wise, overnight, business wise. Um, you can pick up the phone and say, I want to have tea with the president. It will happen. Because mm-hmm. you can pick up the phone and speak us to speak to any top business person in the country mm. and they'll make the time for you. I, I know it's relevant, but by then you haven't met your husband, right? No. When I got crowned, no. I He's got guts, like, <laughs> I'm not here, no. just talk. <laughs> no, he didn't have the guts. If I have to tell you a story, you'll see. You, when, when was it? When uh, did you meet? We met a month after I got crowned. So um, a month after I got crowned, I was going to Kaya FM for an interview Mm. just to talk about being the newly crowned Miss South Africa. And he was leaving Kaya FM Mm. because he was there for an interview to talk about his goal being chosen as one of the top 10 goals in the world for whatever, whatever. Yeah, Yeah, you should know what... (laughs) Yeah, that's yeah. All. yeah. So his goal was chosen and he was leaving for Europe for the very next day. So he was there for an interview just to talk about, yeah, mm-hmm. what it means for his goal to be chosen as the top 10. Um, yeah, and that's how we met. So as I was walking in, he was about to leave. And then his manager, he was Arubella like, manager. Eh? No. Are, are, this is, no, the ah, manager was like, no, the manager was like, this is, uh, yeah, give me South Africa and you're trying to and mm. and then for some, you know, everything happens so fast. These people forced us to take pictures. All of a sudden, Kitya Snapple Mr. 2010. Uh, I'm like, oh, like, oh yes, of course, it's the guy oh, who's man. got the yes, because mm. you know. And um, and then we took pictures, and that was that. And then he went behind my back and asked uh, the producer for my numbers. He said, No, you're gonna get me that girl's numbers. Yeah. The guy was like, but we can't. He said, no, you're going to get me her numbers. And then yeah. that's how we started talking. And then he texted me and he's like, hi, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. This is whoever. I'm like, okay. And then we started talking and yeah. I mean, you intimidated everyone in the podcast studio. <laughs> they, they send me, they send WhatsApp group, more WhatsApp group. They send messages of oh, this woman. Is something else. What? What's <laughs> really? Come on, ah, please. The so I can nice. imagine the first day. <laughs> The first date, sitting in front of you. <laughs> no, it was it was okay. We were, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even call it a first date because, mm. you know, as we were talking and, I mean, the interest from his side was there. On my side, it was like, no, not yet. You know, I'm not. Was he drinking water quickly? We, no, he was, he was well behaved. He's, he's, he's actually a very chilled and very confident guy. Oh, so you guy. wouldn't know. No, that, no, yeah. no, 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 no. And he's very confident. So okay. it, 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 it was just nice to be in a space with somebody who, I get to bang. Mm. I don't know how to explain it. And yeah. he's that type of a person. But I mean, we only dated almost two years later because I refused for two years. Yeah. Hey, wait, it's again. <laughs> yeah, no. There's one was... thing I want to comment about <laughs> Ntate Chavalal. Yeah. Uh, 
There are many things we know about people in the limelight, mm. people in football. Not the only thing I know is that goal. Yeah. <laughs> about him. I get to keep PR or what, but I think the way, the few moments I saw him, I saw his conduct. Yeah. I man, I everything. And I think it, you are blessed to also have someone yeah. like that in your life. No, he's, a, he's an incredible person. And what I love about him is he's the same outside as he is inside the house. Oh, wow. And that matters so much to me because you, you find a lot of amazing men to the world out there, but Garai, they're not like that. So with him, mm. he's a family guy. You know, he loves the kids. He loves me. He loves us doing stuff together as a family. He mm. is very grounded. But also I think, I think oftentimes we want to give credit to the individual, but also he was raised well. Oh. By, by by good parents. And I, I always say they deserve the credit because they raised a very well-mannered respect. Gentleman. Yes. And I remember asking, I'm glad you're saying that because I once had a conversation with my dad and I said, Mara Papa, be honest, were you not worried? <laughs> because I wanted to know, you know, yeah, yeah. when it first came out into the media, we were not ready for people to know. Mm. But I had to obviously make the call to my parents to say, um, and I'd never been in the media for anything like that. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes there's those stories you really cannot... So I said to... I called my parents to say, listen, there's going to be a story on Sunday. And I'm so mm. sorry because I know everything that's always in the papers about me is always, you know, nice things and this. But unfortunately, a story is going to come out that I'm dating someone. And I'm sorry about that. And so my dad was like, okay, give me a talk. And then I told him, say, okay. But is it true? Why <laughs> hopefully go? Yeah, I couldn't stop him up. So he just said, "But is it true?" Yeah. Got it. Mm, okay. Bye. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. You know. You know what but he did after he hanged you, up. Do you dad? think he was happy? For I don't think so. But but yeah, and I asked him a few mm. about a year or two years back, and I said, "Mara Papa, be honest. Were you not worried?" about the fact that you know what they write about footballers um all yeah, this negative stuff i said yeah. were you not worried because they you know my dad loves him and my dad is a huge kaiser chiefs fan Chiefs, so you must know yeah. he definitely loves <laughs> <laughs> you <understand>? <laughs> but i asked him and i said were you not worried because of how the media portrays football players and he said he was very stern. you know my dad is amazing and he said mm. to me i i, I didn't know spiwe but i know you Mm. And you would never choose a man who's not worthy. So I didn't worry. By virtue of your it means he's a good person. And coming to think of it, it's just a small sample yeah. of footballers. Corey, they just take one or two, ne? Yeah. and now they want to paint it like everyone. And it's I like think, that. yes, it's actually a, a media marketing and selling. Oh, strategy. they want to sell papers. That's what and it is, and they have to. And remember, and as black people, we enjoy it. Hmm. We like that. But you know what's sad? What's sad is once you're a public figure, you realize it doesn't even matter whether a story is true or not. Hmm. It doesn't matter. They can call you now and say, well, can we heard or one, two, three, one, two, three. Is it true? I don't know. It's not true. They will still yeah. go and write the, the you know? Yeah. So, so it's so unfortunate for every other person who's had something negative written about them. Because I know for sure, since I am in the so-called public space, 99.9% mm. .9 of the time, it's not true. And mm. that's sad. I also know living the stereotype around DJs. Mm. Every time like I'm a DJ, like yeah. you can see... People who were just warm around you change suddenly. And I'm thinking, yo. And that is sad. Someone will cover deal and then. What do, yeah, but also, what do you have? What does your, your occupation or what you do with your life have to do with your character? Mm. I mean, mm. I, 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 I dated a, a football player, I married one, and people don't even know that I learned about work ethic from this guy. My husband showed up for work every single goddamn day. Wow. Every day, without fail, on time, never late. I'm telling you now the times that my husband missed training was probably because of he you. had an injury or when I was or pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> when I was pregnant, I remember I think he missed <laughs> two or three because I wasn't well and he had to take me to the hospital. But mm. that man taught me about respecting yourself, one, seeing yourself as a business and treating yourself 
uh, with the utmost care and yes. respect as an individual, fully understand that you are the business, mm. but also his level of commitment to the things that he loves. Yes. I've never seen it in anybody till this day. Mm. And mm. so the fact that he plays soccer, it's unfortunate that it might be seen as something, but I, I have learned so much uh, from that man in terms of honoring your contract, mm. um, showing up. Uh, maybe I get a coach here, some writing, and, uh, but he will show up. Mm. Even at training, 150%. So I've learned so much. So for me, I am one of those people genuinely believe what a person does for a living has got absolutely nothing to do with their character. Very <laughs> true, very true. I, I know that a lot of uh, people look up to you and they're going to look up to you for a long time, even I think when you have passed, passed on. But like, what do you think were the key factors that contributed to you winning Miss South Africa? Africa. Or those key things that maybe one maybe can capture them and maybe apply them uh, uh, wanting yeah. to be great or anything? I worked for it. You know, I didn't just wake up one day and decide what I want to be in South Africa. Oh, wow, they've opened entries, let me go. I worked for it. Um, I, 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 I told you, from 2004 when I got trained, I mean, when I got crowned as Miss Teen in Popo, I, I, then I set the goal. Mm. From 2004 to 2010 is six years. It took me six years to get ready to be in South Africa. I went to Joburg. I got there. I won Miss University of Johannesburg. Then I went to. I went on. I won Miss Earth South Africa. I I made sure that before I go and win Miss South Africa, I've already done international pageants representing South Africa. I got myself to those competitions. I made sure. Uh, I, I wanted to make sure that I was so skilled, trained, and ready for that title. That's how much I wanted it. And you that had to I, read a lot. I had to read so much to enlighten myself, to get to know myself as mm, well, mm. Um, to stand on, on your truth. I mean, that's, you know, um, I'll give you a basic example. I remember re Amy as a couple of us, because when we started off, it was like 7,000 whatever girls, and, you know, they'll cut it down, cut it down. But also the interviews are not one-on-ones at that stage. Yeah, keep, keep those ones. Yes, yeah. Yes, uh, and then Bakate. And I remember there was one... Uh, interview whereby Riemi, I think there was 10 of us in a room in front of a panel of judges. And they asked every single girl the same question. It was around the time, yes, strike is my teacher, my nurse. Like you answer while everyone yes. is there. Yes, yeah. Um, and they were asking about the strike. What do you think about the strike? Because I, I can't, yeah. Uh, my nurse and my teacher were not working. They decided we're not going to work. The government is not paying us enough. Mm. So now they mm. asked every single girl that question. And every single girl said it was wrong, it was ter it is terrible, people must show up for work, blah, blah, blah. And when I say standing, knowing yourself, when you know yourself, you stand up for your truth. I was the only girl who said, I am for the strike. You support it. And I told them, I said, I'm a product of a teacher and a nurse. And if the question you're asking me is, should my father have more resources as a principal? My father is a principal, he's a clerk, he's even a teacher. Mm. in a village school. He has no electricity. He has no computer. He must leave Raye. I mean, Meroko, when he gets home, he must start with typing his own things and question papers. And he, he, does, he does the job. Yeah, three people. And remember those long time when they type a question paper, hey, one, mistake, so one mistake, you must start all over <laughs> Thank again. You. I want this thing out. No. Uh... And, and, and I told them, and I said, if you're asking me if the government should shouldn't give my parent, my father enough resources. My question, my answer is he should be striking because he deserves to be in a work environment that's healthy enough for him to do his job. A different his point job of properly. view. I said, my mother is a nurse and I have watched my mother working 12 hours a day from seven to seven. And if the question you're asking me, should my mother as a public servant be paid more? My answer is yes. With limited resources. I want to bandage. I want to 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 I want to
Mm. Where now when you go into any space and you say, this is who I am, and I'm not even apologizing for it, the right people will see you. The right people will see value. So for me, I worked hard for it, but I worked on myself. I worked on my body. I mean, I'm a curvy mm. girl naturally. And I was like, okay, here and there. Still, you know, let me make sure. I don't want to be skinny, mm. but let me make sure I must be comfortable in my own skin. Mm. I must get on that stage and say, this is who I am and I'm proud and I love it, you know? So, um, yeah. So it's a, I mean, I got asked one of those questions as well to say as a curvy girl. And I said, my body says a lot. I said, there's a, there's a history behind my body. It shows you the woman who came before me. Mm. There's a reason why she be a guy in the soul. It mm. tells a story about my ancestors and the people I come from. Wow. So I'm not going to shy away from the fact that I am a curvy girl. It's me, girl. I'm I, here. Kimu, yeah. Kiso. And I love who I am. So mm. it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, you, you can't wake up and decide you want to do it. And it's almost like a calling. You know, I think the saddest thing about pageantry is we don't see it as a talent. So we don't see it as a person can be called to do this. But being mm. in South Africa, it's almost like a calling. You know, it's one girl in a year in a country of millions and millions. And when you see that you are part of the sisterhood, of generations and generations and and you realize just how blessed you are to have been chosen Eish. to to do something this incredible or to be something this incredible mm. Mm -hmm. i think what i'm getting from what you're saying is that we don't get enough time to work on ourselves mm -mm. and we want to see miracles happen yeah whereas the people that must make things change but we need to start with that change. Yeah. I'm, I'm taking that. There's so many things that I must also do. <laughs> that I'm taking. And I, I hope the viewers are listening to that. I think it's one of the highlights of this interview. <laughs> Let's talk about your advocacy and, and the projects that you're involved in. Yeah. Because um, you are known for, for your advocacy work. Yeah. And you can tell us maybe about, uh, you know, cases and projects and courses that you, yeah. are, you are passionate about and that you are working on right yeah. now. I mean, via my foundation, sure, via my foundation, I've always done what we call the Day to Dream campaign. So I started the Day to Dream campaign when I was in South Africa, and I took young girls from Rampatlele, from Gauteng, from Northwest to Sun City for a week, and we did workshops. I, I think I just wanted to instill confidence in them. Uh, mm. to help them with career guidance and choosing the right career for your life. So I got people who could do psychometric um, tests on them. Mm. Uh, I got motivational speakers to come through, people who come from where these girls come from. So Baba if I can, you can. Because I think oftentimes you're stuck in your environment and you think there's nothing else out there. But I really wanted to broaden their horizon. Mm. So mm. after that year, then I realized I won't be able to... It's unfair to only take 70 or 100 girls in a year. So let me start going to schools. Because then I can now reach you're broadening more. Now you're up mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And, and then I started doing it. And I realized that young people need this. Um, and it was incredible. And that's what we still continue to do. And then now as a mom, I have a child who's on the autism spectrum, my mm. son. And so now I do a lot of autism work. Once again, the platform that Miss South Africa has afforded me is that uh, when I speak, then people do hear, yeah. you know, and I do a lot of advo uh, advocacy work. Um, I'm about to open an ECD uh, for children on the spectrum who struggle with speech. Mm -hmm. um, that's what the foundation does. And in pageantry, um, I've opened the African Beauty Academy to, it's a confidence school for young girls. Mm. You know, uh, but also I'm the director of Mrs. Universe Africa. I'm the director of Miss Intercontinental South Africa. And now the chairperson of Miss Limpopo. That's the work I do in pageantry because, um, you know, when I some things, they, they become a little bit of, you know, they, they literally become part of your DNA. Mm -hmm. So and pageantry has become that. You took so, over the Miss Limpopo, no? Yes. So I can't ignore it. Uh, it's part of my DNA. Uh, I'll always go back to pageantry because that's my area um, mm. that I excelled in. Uh, yeah, and then, of course, I've got the kiddies clothing range uh, with black superheroes. So I took my husband's likeness and we turned him into a cartoon. 
and we call it super shop. It's in retail, over mm. 700 stores across the country. It's in Botswana, Swaziland, Namibia, Lesotho, the sub-Saharan countries. Mm. And then I took, yeah, a little princess that looks like me with an Afro, brown skin, put it on clothes, also in retail. So, yeah, I've been in Jet, in Edgars, in Pep. Why? Because identity is everything to me. Mm. Everything. Mm. You know, I, I just remembered as as a little girl, Papaka and Jambopi Omun Swagaye and Egilla because I'd never seen anything that looks like it. And I was so upset. What is your problem, dude? And he said, Can't you see it looks like it's beautiful? <laughs> and so I just always knew that I need to make sure black little boys and girls feel validated. But mm. we live in a world more longer. Our children watch cartoons, Jama Hua, the superhero Jaba Nabal Jaba Shimani, Gibu the Spider Man and Superman and Batman when they take off their masks, they are white. Uh Banabal Navarata di Sophia di Frozen Gema Hua. What are they saying to your children? What are they saying to our children? Mm. It's a non verbal message saying mm. As a boy, you cannot be a hero. You cannot be great. It's a non white. Yeah. It's a nonverbal message to my daughter if she has to play with a white doll. And we say that's beautiful. And because it reminds me of Reiki Beke or when you look at yourself in the mirror, you n I never used to look like anything that's mm. considered beautiful. Mm. And so you, you want to close the gap. In, in certain areas, Norman, we can do better. Why are we waiting for the Disney's of this world to do this for us? We can. My mm. story matters. If I can create a princess called Princess Bokang, she's a girl who grew up in a village and then she becomes the queen now. Wow. She, she gets a crown and, you know, she becomes a mm. princess, um, this and that. And, and the beauty about Princess Bokang is she gets the crown before the prince. Because all these Disney stories teach our little girls that, you know, they need a prince to come hopping on a horse to come and save the day. But they, the they, they might just wait. You're just waiting for Prince Charming. And it, you know what? We, we take it for granted, but that is why little girls aspire to marriage more than little boys. Because everything in our world when we were growing up, every single Disney character, cartoon, it's a princess who is waiting for a prince to come and save ah, the day. Amen. And we are all waiting. I'm a prince. From the time you are, and you think you are, you become a princess because of a prince. But I'm teaching little girls. Your life starts after a prince. Yes. Comes. But I'm teaching a little girl, no. It's the crown first. The prince can come later. If he comes, if he doesn't, it's still okay because you have the crown. And, and I think these are little little messages we need to teach our little girls. And then they make the kind of decisions they make. We start calling it's little them names. messages. Mm. It's little messages that, we, it's that you were taught. Up. Yes, mm. from the youngest, youngest of ages. Yeah, because the, the issue, uh, especially how film was used, the media imperialism has caused a lot of damage. And yeah. I can see that now. Happy you are now on a decolonialization pro mm. program. <laughs> you are now on programming us and making sure that, like, can you imagine having a hero? How, and we have so many Who heroes. Looks like, yes. We have yes. so many of them. Who are real people. You know what's so beautiful when we're doing a store activation or maybe a, a range activation and we're mm. actually at a mall. And these <coughs> kids are coming. <coughs> and then Wawana's Piwe. And they're like, <gasps> It's the him. hero is there. Yes. And then they see me, they're like, it's a real princess. You know, Kibana. And they cannot believe I'm in the presence of a real princess. It's a real person. She looks like me. It's, 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 um, you know, it, 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 for, for some people, they might think it's something small. It is so big and it's so needed and it's so important, especially for our black children. I'm worried now. My daughter said I'm a princess. Uh, you're wondering. <laughs> I think she just. <laughs> I'm wondering where was that coming from. I need to address that seriously. No, there's nothing wrong with little girls wanting to be princesses. I think it's no just, the princess thing. You 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 explained it it's very well. It's important for them to understand they mm. are a princess on their own. Ne? Yes, it's got nothing to do with a prince. As a dad, that's something you must tell her. Yes, baby, you are a princess. You're beautiful. You're enough alone. Here's your crown. 
as your dad, I'm giving you your crown. And in that's the, how you become a princess. In these movies, they get their crown only when the prince yes. comes. Before that, Mutahona, what's my king? It's either what abuse you, what being treated badly, or she's poor. And then the prince charming comes hopping along, takes her from wherever she is, puts her in a castle. Why mm. can't we teach our little girls to build their own castles? Yeah, no, no, no. I think we're getting educated today. <laughs> This, this, this is the kind of content we want, honestly, because if, as parents, we can really listen to what you're saying, mm. we can change a lot of things, uh, the coming generations, mm. by just small actions of monitoring what mm. your kids are consuming, what your kids are wearing. Yeah. You know, uh, and now there's, there's this pepper pig. Mm. I, mm. Like, I just see pigs, <laughs> ne? and my daughter is so obsessed. Ibile, there's a pepper pig show. Mm. She can't wait for it, and she knows them. Kamavito, George, what, what? Mm. George, Lee, Peppa Pig, Mommy Pig, and Daddy Pig. Green <laughs> I know what, them what? very well. And be <clears throat> careful. You, you have to watch what they're watching. Um, there's a lot that they're being taught, and it seems innocent, and it's not. They're injecting that. So much. So much. And unfortunately for us, and I keep saying this, we are parents, we are busy. You, you know, like guys, really just enjoy the monitor a little TV to see what our kids are watching, but we actually have to pay because now our children are very different from the way we're in our own. There's too much access. We them. gave them this powerful smartphones much, and unlimited Wi Fi. There's too much access. My son knows how to do things like I literally feel old when I'm around him because, yeah, I, I know how my parents feel about it. It's a time. Mm. You know, now I know what it feels to be a parent because he he understands, he maneuvers around technology in a way that I can't even comprehend. Mm. There was a time when we couldn't find um, a remote. So all the TVs in the house get a certain brand. There's only one TV that's a different brand. And remote meaning gear one for that TV, I get because you're mm. fail. And we couldn't find the remote. My son took his tablet and turned it into a remote. Now I changed her TV, got tablet. Yeah, a control. Got tablet. Yeah. And we're like, so he is, you know, you have to be so careful. With the YouTube, mm. what are they watching? What do they have access to? They are. They, 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 you know the beauty of uh, access, uh, but there's also the downside mm. to access. And our kids have too much access. I look at my children. My son is nine and my daughter is three turning four. They have too much access to a lot of things, mm. and it's not always good. And I say, while you can, nip it and control it as much as you can as a parent. Mm. Because what's on way longer, you really don't even have control. And we use those devices to, it's like we want to get rid of them. Yes. As long as they are busy with what they are watching, then I can get on with my life. Yeah. I can watch a soap yes. that I want to yes. watch. You don't care and it keeps on changing. That's why I get a lifestyle, the fact that we are a generation of hustlers. We don't have the time and energy, but you have to make it. You really, really have to make the time. Or else, one day you're going to wake up and, uh, yeah, everybody mm. else has raised your kids except you. Yeah. And you have no control. Um, I want you to go deeper a little bit more than Miss Limpopo. Yeah. Uh, because it's our province. Yeah. And everything that says Limpopo to me, I, I always <laughs> like light up. Yeah. What, what are you bringing? What are you working on? What's, what's going to happen this year? Sure, I think it's going to be spectacular. There hasn't been a, a Miss Limpopo under this organization for a couple of years. Um, and, and since the takeover, we are really going to focus on Limpopo as a province through pageantry. Uh, we're going to celebrate culture, her heritage, um, and why? Because we really want it to be a unique type of a pageant. We we also want young people to just make it zebe. You know, your, your identity, it is so important. It is so important for us. For a, it's the same thing as we we're talking about in terms of parenting. When young girls leave this province, they should leave knowing who they are. Mm. Loving who they are. Their identity, their language. You know, when I got to Joburg, I remember, even if a person says, Unjani, I'll be like, I want to in. Yeah. I was so firm and strict about it. Like, I'll yeah. never speak any language. And 
And I would love to see every young person leaving this this uh, this province with that type of a mindset. Mm. Um, and I think that's why the issue of language, culture, and heritage is so big and important to us as an organization and mm. why we want to celebrate it as much as we can. Because Rinyaka, you know, when, when you create little ambassadors for a province, when they get out there, tomorrow from is if no, I get you No, we don't want that. Mm. Uh, we want them to pride themselves in coming from this province because we know also, you know, a lot of people in this country do look down on us. Yeah. You know, uh, we want to bring back the pride. We want to partner with your tourism to make sure that people get to know about the province, the holiday and vacation destinations, heritage the heritage sites. Mm. And we want to utilize pageantry as that wow. because that's what uh, the platform can really do for the province as well. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and one critical thing, as you are talking, I think you're doing so many things. <laughs> and uh, so it got me to think, or like, the balance. Mm. How do you balance all these things? This ah. business, advocacy, your charity programs, uh, Miss Limpopo, all these things. Family life. Mm. That there's impure ones this time. <laughs> but now, how, mm. how do you juggle around all these things? I don't think there's anything as balance. I think it's an illusion. Mm. Um, and um, I love the question you're asking because I always say, my husband never gets asked that question. And you know why? Because nobody expects men mm. to do a hundred things all at once. How do you you want to ask him about game ya guy guy? Mm. You know, you're not really too concerned. Can you do it all? Because men are not really expected to do it all. But I say there is nothing like balance because there really isn't anything like balance. It is mm. an illusion. Um, all you can really do is prioritize. So for me, really na koyaka le my husband kina koyarna. Really na koyabana kina koyabana oya family. When it's time to work, that's it. And it's beautiful if you are with a partner who understands and supports your ambitions. Mm. Because when I say, for a week, my love, this week, you're literally going to get 5% of my time. Can you call here and there? Mm. Uh, and the rest goes to this project that I'm working on. He understands. Mm. You know, if tomorrow I am saying to what's help, or guys, this weekend, please don't talk to me about your long schedules, you know? It's time for me. That's what it is. You prioritize. You can never really fully give yourself to something if everything... Remember, you're doing a million things. Now you're giving 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%. So you'll never excel in anything. But if you want to excel in something, you know, I said, now I'm focusing on this. I'm going to do the best with this regard with regards to this particular thing. You move on to the next thing. You move on to the next thing. But mm. you can't do it all. I mean, there are times where I feel like, ah, oh, you know, I've neglected my husband or I'm neglecting the kids or I'm neglecting my work. It's all part of it. It's part of the beautiful burden. Yeah. And you choose whether that's the life you want or you want to focus on one thing. Mm. Um, biggest lessons, ne? Mm. Uh, teach people things that like nobody can teach you. And I believe that in your journey, there must be this lesson mm. or there must be this Sure. Greatest mistake you have made Greatest and mistake. learned from, or there must be this thing. I don't know. I'm just assuming mm. there must be this thing that when you look back, you say, I'm glad I went through this because this is what I got. Is there any such in your life? I don't know about mistake, but I know as a woman, when you have children and you have a husband. Um, you give so much of yourself to everybody else and you leave very little for yourself. Eesh. And um, I talk about it freely and say, one day I looked in the mirror and I could not recognize myself. And you were not aware you were changing? No. We do it as women when we love. Because for us, we cannot separate the giving from the loving. It's one thing, right? And um, 
and I, you know, you, you sit and you say, where does Bokang fit in all of this? Mm. Because the roles, you know, we, we I, I hate the fact that these roles are, are labeled mother, wife. Because then all of a sudden, Bokang does not exist anymore. Exactly. So the transition, and especially for an ambitious woman, so if you're not the type of woman who just solely aspire to be a mom and a wife, I'm sure it's okay. But if that's not, if, if you're the type of a person like me, very ambitious, very goal-driven, very I'm going to achieve one, two, three. And then one day I woke up and I was like, I think for the past three years, it's just been my husband and kid. Still working, still achieving, but I've forgotten who I am. I, and it wasn't a mistake. I am happy that I went through it like most women do. And, and that's a dream killer too, right? Yes, of mm. course. Because we put our dreams aside because, you know, I'll do it. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we pack, we pack things aside. The moment, there's a, the moment there's a husband, the moment there are kids, we pack so many things aside. And we keep saying to ourselves, I'll come back to it. And sometimes you never do. Because sometimes you never remember who you are. So, yeah. So good for me. I remembered who I am. Mm. And um, I went back to the drawing table and I started again. Um, and I was blessed enough that the person I could remember is somebody incredible. Mm. You know, so I wasn't starting from scratch. And then I just started, you know, taking pieces and pieces of myself and putting myself together again. Mm. So that's that that was probably a very hard um journey or period but I mean that's how I got to start the pageant dear Mrs Universe Africa because I opened it to women that are married divorcees and widowed mm. and I said after realizing this I wanted older women to fetch their lives and fetch their dreams just in case you never got an opportunity to do Miss South Africa back then when you were young, like mm. me, here's an opportunity. And it's not even about the pageantry. But remember I say, we use pa I use pageantry as a tool for so many things. So in this part, I use it as a tool for older, more matured women to just remember who they are. Because we do forget who we are. Mm. We mm. do. In the process of loving, taking care of everybody else. So that, for me, was definitely one of... Yeah, it was one of... Um, a beautiful, hard experience, but it was so valuable. Mm. And and I think the other one will just probably be raising a child who has autism. I think it tested my faith. Mm. I think it pushed me. I think I don't think I've ever fought for anyone as hard as I fought for my son, making sure the right resources were there for him and this mm. and that. And I still count it as one of the biggest blessings ever because most people one, do not have access to the type of information I got, and then two, they don't have the funds to make sure that children have what they need. Many don't even understand Maybe, that children... Exactly, exactly. Mm. And that's why I do the work that I do. Because black people will come up, get this story, well, marriages have fallen apart mm. because the child is different, and black men don't know how to deal with it ego-wise mm. because they see the kids as imperfect. And so they leave the wives. A lot of moms are single parents... Uh, to children that have got autism mm. or anything that's different or, you know, delayed in a child. Mm. And so for me, it's, um, I think, you know, my husband and I always talk about it. It happened to us so we can help other people. Yeah. Uh, and I think sometimes God will take the greatest of us and put us through a, a dark hole just so when we get out, we can, we can literally testify and say we got out and this is how we did it. And if mm. you're going through the same thing, here's a little bit of comfort for you. Uh, yeah, so yeah, so those are probably the two things mm. that I've learned along the way. But I mean, I've been blessed enough with great, amazing life lessons. Uh, and most of them are just simply to know, uh, you know, when you just know you walk in grace, you walk in favor, you don't know where it comes from, but you're humbled that. Yeah. And I don't take anything in my life for granted. I think I'm one of those people. I'm so grateful mm. for everything, big, small, because I just know God had a choice and it could have just not been me. Mm. My life could have turned out any other way, but he still felt her. 
this is the life I'm going to give her. Because it is an incredible life. And I think sometimes when you've lived it for too long, Lord, mm. actually, you know, you're living a life that's a little bit better than most people. And so I, I always try and make sure, you know, I I come back and, you know, always so, remember that I'm so blessed. And I am incredibly. Oh, that's beautiful. Like what you just said uh, before about uh, how sometimes, you know, the roles as a woman, mm. how you get to give everything mm. and forget about your life. I'm thinking it's societal norms. Yeah. And... I'm not trying to be feminist or anything, but I think also men, we sometimes even perpetuate such. Yeah. And that's why great dreams and great things that could have happened uh, maybe to South Africa or the world yeah. were stopped by us, like mm. pr putting a woman in that situation yeah. and not even allow, allowing a woman to actually move. Because remember, we have this thing here, uh, most men or mm. some men, let me just say some men to be <laughs> safe. Uh, you have a powerful, dynamic woman, beautiful and everything, and you don't want the person to go out. Uh, in your circles, you, you meet the who's who's, you meet the powerful guys, and you stop your woman from doing that. No. Okasi, Ogonaban, Lodi Town, Cape Town, no. mm. uh, 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 the whole week, a month like United States, yeah. Uyala. Mm. then you are stopping someone's dreams to make the, li the, the world better. Mm. So it's something that I'm picking up. Uh, we should do introspections. Yeah. Uh, also as men, are we subjecting our women to a point where we're killing their dreams mm. in the name of love? Kim Saryak. Yeah, I think I think also Le, I think women must do better. Mm. I think women must choose better. Mm. You know? Um the fact that the other way around. You get to choose mm. Men are not doing us a favor. When he says, will you marry me? Wow. If anything, you have the power to choose. And I, I say to a lot of people, if while you are dating, you best believe it's probably going to be worse when you get married. And I think Basadi, we have a disease. Yeah, and disease here is hope. We are such hopeful creatures. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know. Mm. You know. Ah, it, it, yeah, you know. It's it's yeah. it's um it's um it's a disease. <laughs> I can't find any other better way to say it. Mm. But and they don't allow you to thrive, uh, or to do better. Uh, don't think what when you get married they'll be any different. Isa. You cannot marry somebody or Asanya gang to see you fully bloom. You can't. You can't. If you're dating somebody and while you are dating, you know, I was thinking of this and then he's like, ah, Maraki Bono Karwena Ntuga Yohona. Shut it down. You, you, Bona. I would do a failure. You cannot. And remember, upbringing plays a huge role. I would have never in any situation been attracted to a man who tells me I can't because my first love told me I can. Mm. So the upbringing... Your dad encouraged you. Mm. It's all I know. So if you come and you don't feel familiar, my husband doesn't say no to me got anything. He says no got other things that mm. have so much to do with spending. <laughs> but of course. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he yeah. will not say no when I come up with an idea or I am sharing. He has never said to me, I don't think I don't think we did ever. Mm. I've been with that man for how many years now? Is it 12 years? I've been with him for 12 years. And, and in the, the 12 goal years, was scored in 2010. <laughs> I've been with him for 12 years. He has yeah. never told me I can't. Mm. I'm not capable. So I think that I'm bringing you up in your life. I will talk and I will talk and I will talk and I will talk and I will talk. Fathers are needed. You know, our mothers are there praying. You know, I, I mean, I don't think I would be this protected if it wasn't my mother's prayers. I don't think I would be. My mother prays for us like nobody's business. Mm. I know I'm protected. I walk with something great because of my mom. But I know what my self-worth 
comes from my father. Gents, and let's that do becomes, introspection. That becomes the let's t- do introspection. You ha- you and your daughters need you, mm. but also your sons need you. So it's um, yeah, it's a tough it's a tough situation in terms of society and how things are and how broken things are. But um, the thing is, broken people will always go for broken people. It's 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 what's familiar. Oh, it's re- what's familiar. Re- <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like that, but yeah, it's um yeah. Hmm. So I just think I just think yeah I just think um whoever you choose to spend the rest of your life with will determine how high you fly. Hmm. They'll determine how high you fly. Wow. Whoever you choose to spend the rest of your life with. Hmm. Yeah. There's one key thing about being up there, or being a public figure and a role model to men. Uh, I believe it's like handling criticism, the setbacks. Yeah, it's very key because many people are looking up to you. Luena, yeah. there's this pressure. I know that we try to overcome it or no. Uh, I I don't care about what people say. Mm. But how do you handle criticism and setbacks? Like in a way that one would understand that, because obviously situations differ. Mm. But you being up and then there's this criticism because people now it's worse. We've got social media where yes. someone aduji mo mo adile ko bo mo fatsi what's working? I know. Otu gera headboard yag. Yeah. Hey, otu do as you want. Then how how do you deal with? And I I think it's 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 very important because people are crying about depression. You know, I nearly mm. took my life mm. because of this and that. Uh, I didn't even want to get out of the house. Yeah. Like, how do you handle it? Because I believe that you've got criticism even after you won. Yeah. There was someone who said, no, yeah, it can't I mean, be her. No, of course, of mm. course. I think, I think actually the first, um, you, yeah, actually, let me share this. The first time I ever experienced racism was when I got crowned as Miss South Africa. Why people were upset. Got the organizers of Miss South Africa. Yeah, no, why people in the country were upset. Mm. They didn't want a black girl. There hadn't been a black girl for about a good seven years. And why people were pissed off. Hmm. And it was this and that. Who, who, who are you with on the top three? There uh, was there a promising white girl there? Yeah, you, there was. You, and she was my friend. It must she have was made lovely. It worse. There was an Indian girl and mm. uh, a white girl, you know? Mm. And, uh, and they were upset. And that was the first time I ever experienced proper racism. And I think it was the first time I fully understood what it means to be a black person in this country, Eish. what the color of my skin meant, and the fact that actually the color of my skin uh, is can be seen as something negative. And they were throwing everything. And remember, still back then, I was lucky because there was no social media, necessarily Facebook, when it was still right at the beginning, mm. you know? So how I handled that, it was, um, like I'm saying, you know, you, you work on yourself, mm. Oh, sorry. They probably know you're talking about them. Now. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just no problem. Sorry about that. Yeah, but if it's very important, you can take no, it. No, okay. no, no, no. They sure. will just um, yeah. It's Google. Please find out what she, she needs. Yeah. So so now yeah. So, now they are throwing everything. That yeah. Time. And um, yeah, for me it was a matter of I'm here because I deserve it. I worked hard for this, you know, that's how I got to survive that area, that era of my life. But I mean, now, um, trolls are there on social media. Yeah. First of all, I stay away from social media as much as I can. To protect yourself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for, for my sanity. Yeah. So I will go, I post whatever I post and then get really, you know, I do my other things. Maybe I'll come back and uh, respond to people and that. But I think also... You know, when I'm, when I'm talking about grace and favor, I've been blessed enough that a huge percentage of people don't really hate me or dislike me. So I don't get people being very mean or ugly mm. a lot. But also that's because I, I live a very private life. I don't, you, you, you'll hardly see much about me on social media. That's very true. I, I, I put out I what... I tried to search for yeah, this. Yeah, I... <laughs> Where is, where is this woman? I just, I saw when no. you were launching uh, the superhero yeah. session. I was like, 
No, you I, you will only see what I want mm. you to see. Yeah. And it's my choice to make sure that I have full control. And you know, when I prepare for the show, I don't look at stories from papers. Yeah. And because I know that most of them are not very accurate. Yeah. And I feel like I'll be taking the standard of the show yeah. or what we want it to be down if I try to say, but in 2016, <laughs> uh, there was this article about... Yeah. So I try not to look at that, but I try to look at for other things. And I'm like, I don't know who's managing your private life. Ne? I, we can't see anything. No, you won't see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you only see what I want you to see. Yeah, and, and sometimes when people get criticism or get insulted, it is because of what we show them. Yeah, so you, sometimes you just give more than you should. Then you cry. Yeah, of, and then of it, mm. you know, you, you put too much of yourself out there and then when people start criticizing, you want to cry. I'm not saying they've got it right, mm. but try and control as much as you can. There's so many things in this world you can't control. Yeah. The little bit that you can, do. Mm. And I'm very overprotective when it comes to my personal life, my family, my kids, and, and even some of my work. So you only, like I'm saying, you only see what I want you to see. Mm. And it's, it's not much. It's not much. It's eh? not much. I want to wrap up now, <laughs> but I want to give you this blank page where, you know, you can tell us your future aspirations, both personally, <laughs> professionally, and if there are um, any other thing, if, if there's anything you want to tell people who are following you or people who are listening to this, anything, like just, just shoot and look at this camera and just talk to your people. <laughs> that one. Sure, that's a tough one. I think um, ultimately what I would want to say is, sure, ask yourself what type of a legacy you want to leave behind. I think um, we are all created to do something great, even if it's not meant to be on the same level or of the same magnitude. Wow. But I think we are all meant to do something great. I think we are all meant to heal this world in one way or another, whether it's through your talent, through your work, through whatever it is you, you do, whether it's just making people laugh. Um, so I would say to anyone watching, find out what it is you are created to do mm. and just do it and just do it and just enjoy it. That's it. Discover who you are. Discover why you were created. Discover why you're in this world. Discover why, why God took the time to even create you. It wasn't in vain. You're here because you're meant to be here. <laughs> so find out why you're supposed to be here and just do it. Just do it. Powerful. <laughs> I think I'm born to DJ. <laughs> exactly. Do it. <laughs> Do it. Don't take it for granted. The fact that you can make people dance. Yeah. The joy. Mm. I, I, I can only imagine what artists feel like. But because I've been there, when you're on a stage and all these people are there cheering for you, can you imagine? You're a DJ. In your own more. You're a ministry. Yeah. You, it, it's ministry yeah. in your own way. For that moment in time, people are happy. Do it People right, are dancing. Enjoy it. Pe that's it. Mm. That's that's probably the one way how you heal. Mm. That's how you heal. Do but that's why I say we are all created to heal something in this world. Mm. How we just do it in different ways. So continue DJing. DJ, DJ you. your heart out and make us dance and bring us joy and happiness. Thank <laughs> you. There's, 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 there's so much wisdom that I got today. <laughs> Uh, I can't wait to even listen again to this podcast. There's, there's, there's a lot of things that one can take. And I, I, I'm, I'm even believing, Ori, the people who are viewing this now, they are ticking and they are writing down because you are dropping gems that I Thank believe. Thank uh, If one can take them, nurture them, can actually make uh, something better about life yeah, and can also make uh, life for another person better. Mm. And thank you for coming to Just Talk. Thank you. With DJ I had so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening to Just Talk with DJ Cappuccino. I would like to thank Mabutapa Productions, Styles and States, my guys. Uh, um, and thank you for everyone who's always commenting and asking questions on each and every episode. We love the criticism. Shoot, <laughs> she can handle it. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. Just Talk with DJ Cappuccino by Son of Gazan. Yeah.
Just talk with DJ Cappuccino.